right, what we're going to do now is have a panel discussion before I open it up to the audience. So the idea <coughs> is that you've got about 15, maybe 20 minutes tops to come up with your questions. If I can see there's eagerness in your faces, I will curtail that 15 to 20 minutes and cut to you more quickly. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'll be checking in. That's okay. um, right, first of all, we've got uh, a couple of strange faces in town. We haven't heard from two people who are sitting behind the table here. So, first of all, may I um, ask Jeff, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience, say a little bit about yourself and your organisation? Uh, hello, I'm Jeff Draper. I'm uh, a physicist but also a chartered accountant. I uh, took all that against me, but I work for um, a company called Store Electric, which I co founded with my business partner Mark over there. What we're proposing to do is build compressed air energy storage along the lines of uh, what Goran was uh, showing, um, and basically build it in Cheshire. Um, the size of the project, well basically we're working with Siemens, we're working with a few Siddles companies, we're working with Price Waterhouse Coopers who've just invested in us, uh, and we're looking to build um, a huge battery under the ground, uh, initially potentially about 40 megawatts, but the difference is using salt caverns which would <coughs> excuse me, hold about 6 gigawatt hours of energy, which to put that into context is roughly about two-thirds of the energy capacity of Denorwick. We could do that for about 30 million quid. So in terms of financials, that's about a hundredth of the cost that Denorwick would, would cost these days to build. That's the big difference with compressed air energy storage. Um, working with Siemens, we've managed to get our electricity in, electricity out efficiencies up to about 63%, and that's been corroborated by our own engineers. Uh, so we feel that we're getting somewhere, uh, we just need the finance to build it, but we're working on that as well. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and the other stranger in town, John, would you like to introduce yourself, please? I'm John Prendergast, I'm a development manager at RES Renewable Energy Systems. Uh, we're a, uh, a global independent renewable energy developer and we're now also building, um, developing and building our own energy storage projects and offering EPC wrapped energy storage installations to third parties as well. Um, RES is active in renewables for about 20 odd years now. We're active in wind, solar, um, transmission and now also energy storage. We've built about 9 gigawatts of wind and solar and this year we built our first two grid scale uh, energy storage battery systems two four megawatt systems in north america during frequency regulation um, we are firmly committed to increasing penetration of renewables on the electricity grid and i concur with a lot of what goran said about how the um, challenges we face in increasing penetration of renewables um, have wide-ranging applications for storage so beyond direct integration of um, renew or of storage behind the meter on renewable farms, wind farms and solar farms, there's a wide need for increasing system services, stability services, ramping services, reserve services, and also a wide re need for distribution network upgrade, and we see storage playing a role in all of those. Um, we've been active in storage for about four years now. We've looked at about 130 different storage technologies and vendors. We've looked at all the compressed air systems, the pumped heat systems, liquid air systems, myriad of different battery chemistries, flywheels, um, uh, and all sorts of, every, you name it, we've looked at it. For the projects we're building, we've essentially honed in on um, proven technologies, so we're focusing on a couple of lithium ion battery chemistries. Uh, we essentially want projects, uh, we want to build projects with technologies that are um, commercially proven, able to stand behind warranties and guarantees, and safe. Um, so while we're very interested in the development of compressed air systems, um, pumped heat systems, liquid air systems, we see them as quite long-term plays, and very necessary if we are to hit the sort of renewable penetration targets we're aiming for for 2030, 2050. Um, but for the time being, for the projects we're building, we're, we're looking at lithium-ion 
as I said, this year we built two four megawatt systems in North America. Next year we'll build two 20 megawatt systems and a further two megawatt system again in North America. Uh, the first two of those um, this year, both providing frequency regulation services based on fast acting uh, response, get paid for performance in the US now. So the, the value of the fast acting storage delivers to grid operators um, is now recognized in the US in a way that is not recognized yet in the UK. Um, so it's unlocked the business case there. Uh, we commissioned the first one in Ohio in March this year. Uh, that's delivering frequency regulation to PJM, the largest grid operator in the US, uh, followed on with a second similar project in Ontario, essentially a carbon copy. Both of those performing really nicely, so we've just announced plans to do two more at 20 megawatt in Illinois next year. Um, and uh, also we're doing our first distribution deferral project in Washington State, two megawatt, 4.4 megawatt hour system um, for a remote town to do outage mitigation and microgridding, integrating with the a local run of river system when the grid goes down in bad weather. So we, we are quite excited about those in the US. We think um, definitely potential in the UK. Um, the biggest issues we see here are less technology. Technology costs are coming down. Um, lithium ion costs are coming down significantly over the next couple of years. The issues we want to see sorted out are mainly regulatory and market issues to enable us to stack the sort of benefits that Gorn was talking about. John, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we haven't heard from James for a while, so let me first pitch a question to you. Um, as a, an investor standing behind a developer, what difference would having uh, a menu of proven storage technologies make to you and the investments in the back? So I was thinking as I was thinking as the others were talking about some of the different dimensions, and I think we talked about scale. Um, uh, we talked about a number of standalone projects. Um, and you know, the, the other thing I, I suppose ultimately is retrofitting. So it slightly depends you know, where we're considering playing on that spectrum. But you know, we're aware of projects now which, um, for many reasons, it may be ability to connect to the grid, for example, of becoming an increasing problem where the introduction of storage into those projects actually enables uh, a, a much larger project than otherwise would be the case to become viable and actually <clears throat> to, to mean rather just exporting the, uh, the energy as it's produced, build in the ability to provide some sort of utility services and, uh, and trading. Um, that's quite novel, I think. It's, we, we know, we're not seeing a lot of that today, but I think the, the pricing is coming down to a point where these developers are starting to talk about it. Um, part of the challenge then becomes how do you start to quantify and therefore value um, a, a less uh, sort of predictable um, revenue stream. And um, you know, we're starting to look at one particular project and in many ways, some of the merits of that project are the ability to take advantage of some of these sort of price spikes that, that, that we've um, that we've seen. The challenge is how do you um, how do you forecast those with any degree of accuracy, and to what extent are you know investors in in the funds that we may be putting together comfortable with that? So I think there's a sort of a big educational piece. I think as as, as Goran was alluding to. Um, but in terms of the opportunities to enhance existing projects, I think we're starting to see more opportunities there. John, you mentioned about uh, lithium ion uh, being one particular focus for the moment because it's proven technology. Um, if you had others to choose from, as in they were deemed for proven, what uh, particular doors would that open for you? Um. I think one of the principal issues with lithium ion is that while it is proven, cost scale with megawatt hours. So if you want to go for bulk storage rather than power services, it becomes quite expensive. So if we were talking about integrating for you know dealing with wind farm constraints and things like that, really we need you know, large scale flow batteries or we need compressed air systems, that sort of system um, rather than lithium ion. I think. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me throw in a slight curveball now because we haven't really focused a lot on hydrogen so far. And 
There's as much to provoke one or two people, perhaps in the audience, to come forward with their questions. So, so follow this one carefully. Um, hydrogen, some people would say, um, is actually the answer to all this. Um, it is, after all, uh, something which is uh, very clean, um, it's extremely flexible, can be used in a number of different ways. So surely hydrogen has to be the answer, and all we need to do is invest everything in, into developing the hydrogen infrastructure, um, and uh, you know, we'll be good. Um, a few words, perhaps, starting with Gordon. Do you have uh, some thoughts on, the, on where hydrogen fits in all of this? Yeah, I mean, the hydrogen is... Uh, um, I've not done detailed work. We are still um, um, in the process of doing that. But the hydrogen, you know, at the high level is this, is, is this there, is a, there is a big issue with hydrogen, which is electricity is incredibly high quality energy. So again, how desperate you need to be to uh, transform your electricity into hydrogen and then get back and then waste about 50% of energy you put in. That's the, that's the, you know, the high level, that's what it is. Well, there, there, this is me simplifying. The hydrogen's got also, you know, potentially other applications. But the, the um, uh, so as I say, I've not done the actual analysis, but uh, given how difficult the systems which we are thinking of developing, how difficult they are, I wouldn't be surprised if our analysis, you know, suggests, and I've not seen, that's what I, you know, I've not seen really kind of the evidence you know, there's lots of discussions about, you know, different futures. But what, what I think what we are missing currently in hydrogen is really the evidence which would tell us this is why and when, this is and how much you know would work. But I say I wouldn't be too surprised, given how difficult these systems are, that we may actually that it may be overall um, cost effective to waste fifty percent of this energy from electricity uh, because the systems are just too difficult. So. It, it's not easy. To, I'm sorry, I wasn't able, can't able to, not able to answer you directly, but maybe in a few months' time we'll have a, we'll have a bit more analysis done. Uh, Steve, you've looked at a range of different technologies and in what you did, research that you've done. You must have looked at hydrogen. Where did that fit in your thinking? Um, yeah, I think so. Sort of Karen from from Goron has seen that um, <coughs> the production of the, of, of the hydrogen is, is the key. Now, if we've got excess energy. And in the system, and you can use that to use hydrogen. Then the model starts to, to balance out. Um, but the you know the cost of putting a hydrogen network in, all those kind of you know infrastructure costs, which you know as Grant said, we're broke. We can't afford that. You know we we're struggling to uh, to fund the current things. Um, you know it's, it really is sort of um, you know a cart full of horse kind of thing with with hydrogen at the moment. We, we need a network there for it to be adopted. Um, you know, in a, in, a, in a big way, um, and then you know, is that the best? If you've got excess energy, is that the best way to use it? Are we better off storing it and using it um, in a different way, in a more efficient way? So there's a whole, you know, I think the the hydrogen uh, economy, um, you know, a number of years ago was, fortunately, politicians got all of it, I think, and trumpeted out as here's the big, big answer, um, and it wasn't quite wasn't quite ready. Um, so a lot of investors are, are quite worried of investing in hydrogen at the moment because of the sort of stop start um, from a few years ago, which is a shame. But you know, that's, that's the way things work. Could I just uh, just that this uh, uh, just uh, reminded me the, the there is a, another issue which is potentially interesting to, to to bear in mind, maybe discuss, is this question of incremental versus strategic thinking. Uh, that because if you are, and we are currently a bit of a paranoia regarding the energy costs here, uh, and if you if you kind of don't reopen, you know, kind of big big questions, then potentially it may never it may never happen, because if we are only thinking about you know next year and next year, then you would never go to strategic investment. Yes. And if I just use an example, electricity, uh, which is you know after the Second World War. The strategic decision was made that the that uh, uh, production of electricity and consumption of electricity in the UK would increase ten times in order to facilitate economic development of the country, and the decision was made to develop national transmission network, and the voltage level. This is also using details was increased almost 10 times 
was a completely new technology. And that infrastructure was only fully used 25 years later. Okay? But we all say, how wonderful decision we made at that point in time. Yeah? And it's quite difficult to see, I think it's quite interesting to see whether and how we would facilitate, maybe this example is, is, is slightly extreme, but you know, just to it, how we facilitate a bit more of a strategic thinking going forward. And because the, you know, because the, if we, potentially if we don't, we, we may have our costs reduced in the short term, but actually in the long term, the potential is going to be very high. So how we balance the, the benefits and costs to existing versus future consumers is, a, is an important element of discussion. That, you know, we're good to, but we're not, we're not moving very, very you know, not only UK, it's, it's, it's very, 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 very difficult times to, to do something like this, but hydrogen potential is one of the topics which would deserve potentially s s such an attention. Yeah. You raise a very interesting point. Um, I have to know because I wrote it down. Between October 2011 and March 2013, 224 gigawatt hours of potential energy were turned down from UK wind farms alone. Um, and they received as a result £7.5 million out of £170 million total 2013, curtailing and balancing payments. So, out of you know, that early, early <coughs> stage of wind farm development, we were already looking to generate at times when the, the grid had to turn around and say, no, actually, no, you can't. There are very good reasons why you cannot generate now, and what's more, we'll pay you not to generate. And this is only going to get larger, so storage is an issue very much today, as well as something that we need to look forward at and invest in the future. Jess, just finishing off on the, the hydrogen round, if I may, mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing you must do comparisons of your technology versus the others. And while you're obviously very much at utility scale, um, and hydrogen probably is more sort of middle ranking, um, do, have you sort of assessed your costs against things like hydrogen? You no, know, we could use hydrogen in our technology as well. I mean, I guess the answer to your question is hydrogen definitely will happen. And one of the reasons it will happen is, is because of the excess of energy. Um, I, I guess, you, you only need to look at the German situation at the moment, it's actually too much renewable energy, and that's set to double over the next 10 years. So the problem isn't balancing the, the peaks and troughs, that is a problem, but the problem in the future is how are you going to store the excess energy? Now, reverse, man or reverse engineering of, of chemicals is quite possible at the moment, you look at the crazy situation we've got at the moment where we're burning fossil fuels to create energy. It's quite likely in the future, once we've got this massive amount of electricity being produced all around the world, that the excess energy will be used to reverse engineer chemicals like hydrogen, which can then be used for, for those, you know, that will definitely happen. In terms of how we'd use hydrogen, um, when you compress air, uh, it heats up, that goes into the solar cabin. When, when you need to release it for peak or whatever, it cools down. That cooling process could actually freeze the air and seize up the whole system. So you need to have a situation where you can heat that frozen air. Hydrogen would be a perfect fuel for doing that and it enables the technology to be 100% renewable. So I, I guess yes in both cases. Hydrogen will happen and we could use it in our technology as well. Casting an eye to see um, the, the level of eagerness, um, yes, I, I'm getting responses, which is what I was fishing for. So, on that basis, I'll just do it on <coughs> whose hand went up first, and it's the dean, just holding the pen. Sorry, you're behind something, I can't see. Hello. Hi, I'm Bill Watts from Mac Ford. Can you just wait for the mic, actually, just to make things a bit easier? Because it does echo it. Thank you. Hi, Bill Watts from Max Fordham's. The issue, we've been talking about storage, but we have not been talking about seasonal storage. The graphs stop at 10 hours or maybe 24 hours. Uh, it seems that the, if there is an elephant in the room, it's seasonal storage, which is about heat, presumably. Um, and I'm looking, I'm wondering if the analysis that was done on uh, the, by Goran was factored in the electrification of heat um, because the heat, uh, the peak heat load at the moment is 300 gigawatts. 
as opposed to um, 60 gigawatts for power. So it's going to have a massive disproportionate effect and highly seasonal, as said before. Um, is it not better to store the energy chemically for that long period of time? It need be hydrogen. The hydrogen can be used to upgrade uh, biogas and turn it into um, commercial grade methane using the network we've got. Thank you, that was just one. Thank you. Um, Gordon, are you? Well, I could, yeah, the, absolutely the point that heat is, is five times bigger than it is more than 50% of the entire energy is heat. You're absolutely correct. I mean, understanding that is, is, is absolutely essential. Um, the, the, uh, some of the answers are that we do have, if I can you know, be a bit kind of extreme again, seasonal storage. We've got a pile of coal or tank of gas is a seasonal storage. And so we, you know, so, so and, and one of the answers is that, and obviously it would depend what the, what the cost of that is, and the, the, where the current thinking is, look, and I've not, again, analyzed the details of technology, is that the, for example, if we want to do, if we develop CCS uh, the, the, um, uh, for, for gas and coal, problem solved. Yeah, because we can shift, you know, pile of coal sits there for winter, so that, you know, the storage is in there. But there are technologies, you're absolutely right, I'm, this, I'm painting a little bit of a picture. You're absolutely right. I mean, how we would manage that is is uh, is a uh, 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 critically important topic. But as I say, currently the information which we have is that there isn't a huge amount of cost-effective seasonal storage available yet. But very happy to you know to, to catch up with you a bit later to see what the uh, you know if we are missing something. I think anybody in the the heat uh, power the heat energy space would suggest that. Heat is easier to store than electricity at the end of the day. And should we actually be looking at um, thermal energy solutions for electricity? Um, Steve, is this something you again looked at in your research? Um, <coughs> not repairs, but uh, the company has definitely. Uh, the way they design buildings, etc., these days, is much more looking at the thermal mass of buildings and how they can integrate uh, energy storage in terms of heat into those buildings. Um, so there's, there's an awful lot of work going on in that, in that sphere, not so much in terms of uh, seasonal, but certainly in terms of, of usage over the, uh, the, the life cycle of a bit, or the day cycle of the building. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, technology going into that and storing heat in, within structures. John, is this an area you've looked at at all in your space? I, I recognise the point, but uh, no, it's not something we've, we've really looked at. No, again, from the point of view as a developer, we're looking for essentially proven technologies yeah. and it's something yeah, in some way away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mike is coming. <coughs> Hello, Mark Howard, Store Electric. I'm going to work with Jen. Um, just a question for Steve and for John. Uh, Steve, one of your earlier slides showed kilowatt and megawatt scale storage. And John, you're talking about 2 and 20 megawatts, presumably for between 15 and 30 minutes, which is what the battery storage is. Um, and yet, Goran's uh, graphs showed that there was need for multi gigawatt, multi hour storage. What do you see as fulfilling that level of demand? Um, it's, well, from our point of view, I think it's multiple of really. I mean, I think that's that's the whole point of the presentation. Is that I don't see any one particular you know, application. There's no silver bullet, unfortunately. It's, they've all got the right place where they're going to be. If you want, you know, we aren't going to build another Norwich um, because you know, it's not feasible. Um, well, not feasible, but you know, it's always the issues I say around it, the cost of it, everything else. There's lots of better technologies that shows if, if we can find the right place can can fill those gaps so I think you know a great believer in you know innovation moving things on as well I think once we you know if we can start getting over some of these hurdles that stop is actually developing I think things will move on at a pace um, to develop these technologies even further and make them much more efficient I suppose the, uh, the the answer you're looking for is compressed air I think. <laughs> <laughs> right <on. laughs> but I, I think it, it's clearly in a race. Um, you know, if you look at the, the sort of numbers that are projected for the type of cost that compressed air systems can achieve, clearly um, it's, it's a good candidate. Um, but 
they're not really getting built at the moment. Lithium ion systems are getting built and the costs are coming down. There's quite a lot of research going on in other battery chemistries. So I think if, if compressed air is to get out there and do it, it has to get out there and do it before these other technologies get ahead because I think uh, they're catching up fast. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, point of clarification. Okay. Yes, a point of clarification first. You said 225 gigawatt hours a, a year that was uh, basically rejected uh, for, from the wind turbine producers? A year and a half, yes. Yeah, over a year and a half, so 180 or something. Yeah. Okay, so my question is, uh, for, a, for anyone, is there not already an existing um, market uh, uh, place uh, reality to facilitate uh, arbitrage or the, or the buying and selling of that extra energy? I mean, why can't I, you know, this is the, the, you know, the exaggerated, but why couldn't a guy put, you know, 100, 100 uh, deep cycle batteries in his, uh, his backyard and be buying and selling from the wind turbine guys, you know, buying it at, at a 10% and selling it at, at 30? And is there, is there not, and I'm not for that small, but just as an example, is there not, is there not, is the marketplace, to, it doesn't seem very complicated for, to be able to buy and sell energy and, and store it. In a, in, a, in a compressed air cavern uh, today, you know, if you, if you, you know, where, what's the, what is the state of, of the marketplace? Thank you. Go on, I think it's probably what you must Well, I can, we don't have a market, the prices, when we could tell this, prices didn't go to zero. It was to do with the transmission constraints. We do not have what's called locational margin pricing. So prices in the UK did not reflect the reality of the situation. But, I mean, Simple. The, the, the wind turbine, owner is not able to sell his electricity during that time. Oh, no, 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 he get compensation. He gets, he gets paid. Yeah, but seven and a half million, you know, over for two, two, uh, for 180 gigawatt hours. No, they, they get compensation, they are not worse off, They're, they get exactly what they would get. Now, the CFDs now, the new market arrangements are such that they would get paid exactly what they asked for. So there's no question about them being oh, in any the, whether way. They deliver, whether the delivered energy is yeah. used or not. They it's irrelevant. Paid, they oh, get so paid all the time. So but you're you're the right. Market market. The system is a lazy system at the moment yeah. in the UK. But they will still get paid. But it's a waste of energy. Uh -huh. You look at the system. But it would, tomorrow you could turn it on and yeah. arbitrage yeah. it. And, and Currently, that would be uh -huh. smart. Currently, that, that'll not. change. I mean, you look at the Netherlands is getting negatively priced electricity coming through Germany at the moment because the interconnector, they're quite happy. But that, they're trying to change that market in Europe as well to have minimum prices. So, uh, which is, I, I don't know, it's probably against European law. But at the end of the day, that will, will happen. And eventually, the whole of Europe, because of the interconnectors, will, will be one energy and, market. And, and then there's the, the next question is, OK, so the power um, purchasing company, he, he's saying, I don't, uh, he's got to pay out that money to the renewable guys, and yet he can't use the energy. So. Yeah. Is he, is he, um, why doesn't he sell it? Well, it's, it's the government that are paying. Oh, government, it's, 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 it's consumers that are paying. This is so, so, cost so, so cost. Well, I know who's, okay, so they're paying the, so the only, wind turbine guy, yeah. but somebody's, but that energy is being thrown away. We're, we're paying, yes. yeah. But why isn't it fed back in? Can I, can I just, um, I think it's probably a discussion to continue <laughs> afterwards. Maybe come back to, to the audience. You'll be very patient, yes. Mortimer Menzel from Augusta. I, I'd like some help on electricity price forecasting because we're having a major headache convincing ourselves and our investors that over the long term electricity prices will trend up. And the, the figures I saw from you, Garen, were, were frightening in the extreme. The problem is that in the countries, a lot of renewables like Germany, for example, and also in the UK, the expectation of recently electricity prices have been trending down in countries like Germany, much more so because of coal and, and other macro factors. Now, the experts all say they're going to trend up because of carbon, uh, uh, you know, carbon penalties and so forth. But investors are increasingly not believing that anymore, sort of at the end of a particular tariff period or at the end of a CFD period. So we're having a hard time making that argument. The question is, do you think the storage technology or the storage industry today assists in that argument? Can we say, look, there, is, there are storage people out there. There are several people investing and doing it. It's good enough to make an argument that in 10 to 15 years, you are going to see balancing and therefore a more efficient use of the, of the power on the system. 
Um, <coughs> I think um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> I think um, you know if the use of storage effectively gives you control of when you sell your electricity. If the price isn't right, you, you don't sell it. Uh, there's all issues about leakage and things and all those kind of things, depending on what technology you're using. But overall, it puts the the power into the person who's, who's holding the energy. So if the price at the point of um, buying it from them isn't right, they don't, they don't sell. They don't have to sell. Um, so it kind of just generate a market, and they kind of to be up and work out when they do that. And there are people looking at, at trying to get that working and, and, and trading it. Yeah, as it's commodity, trade it on the market. Um, of course, what governments are concerned about is it becomes you know, out of control and there's too many traders and you end up with a bit like the uh, sort of oil uh, in the 70s kind of thing where you've got people dominating and demanding prices that are, uh, are not achievable. Um, so you need to get that mix right. But yeah, generally, I mean, you know, there's nothing to stop. You know, the control goes into the into people who've got the storage, and I think that's that's one of the advantages of it. A lot of my clients that, you know, are using the power themselves, not selling it. They're offsetting high import costs, so oh, well, that's what we're looking at. So it, it, it makes economic sense for them. You know, instead of instead of selling it to the grid at thirty pound, you know, they, they're offsetting the imported cost of a hundred pound. Yeah, you know, so you can you, it gives you control in the right situations. So on the back of that, are you saying that the price of electricity like all together will continue to trend. Yeah, I mean, the current trend is, is because oil's gone down, it's because of the bottom, and yeah, <coughs> not where well, I'm surrounded by investors and financial people here, but yeah, <laughs> I tend to have a very short term view of, of where the market's going. Um, you know, it will eventually, you know, Saudis are pumping oil in, out, you know, at a low price for whatever reason. Um, you know, and that's, that's in affecting the markets at the moment. If, if they change their attitude, um, it could very quickly swing the other way. We've all seen in the past, you know, and all the outcry now about prices going up but not coming down <coughs> as fast as they, as it, it just come down to the, to the wholesale buyers. Um, you know, it's not an ideal market by any stretch of imagination. Correct. Well, to say that uh, I think the, what matters for storage is the price difference between high and low. If it's all the time high, all the time low, Storage, storage does the <coughs> job, buy cheap and sell expensive. That's what the storage does. So what we, what, what we need to have, and that's what the current markets are not delivering, they're not cost, they're, they're not uh, cost effective. The prices are not nowhere near as volatile as they ideally should be. And the volatility, you know, you, you know if you've got, if you, if you start putting wind and solar in the system, you know, the, the organizer tells you the volatility of prices would increase significantly. And you should be able to, you know, make money from arbitrage and also selling services, but the present markets are not quite, the design of the market is not reflecting the reality of the situation. Sorry. And that's why, you know, in Germany, in fact, the price volatility has dropped with having wind and soap. And when you ask how is that possible, you will find out it's possible because the market, the, the, how we calculate the prices is, is, is inefficient. So I just made one further point. If you've got, look at demand side response. If you've got a grid phone up Rolls Royce saying you've got to cut your energy usage in the middle of the day when they're at mass production, you know, they don't want to do that. That's going to hurt their business. You've got two choices on a shift to work in the night when they're not going to get those cuts or have their own energy on site. And we could generate it. And we could, yeah. It's a double-edged sword. I mean, the, the short answer is you're going to see a lot of volatility over the next decade or so. Uh, but long term, the pro prognosis for electricity is good, I'd say, but it, it will definitely need storage. So, if you take the German example, the, the likes of RWE and Eon used to make most of their profits in the middle of the afternoon in Germany. That's when the peak was. But <coughs> Because Germany's now got about 36 gigawatt capacity of solar on top of people's roofs, that's completely flattened the peak in the middle of the afternoon. So there's no profits to be made by RWE and E.ON anymore. And they've got a basically a flawed business model, and so have the other mass generators now. That's a huge problem. You only need one of them to go under or, or basically to stop building gas-fired power stations, which they're the stopping building right now and closing a few, and then you say, well, where's the backup gone? So on the one hand, you've got, yeah, we've got all this electricity, but on the other hand, 
the existing utilities are closing down all the backup when the winds are not blowing and the sun's not shining. So that actually increases the likelihood of blackouts unless you can come up with, with something better. And Germany at the moment is just relying on a, a few things. And it's a bit crazy, but they're backing up their system with coal again, which kind of goes against what they, the whole thing in the first place, and gas and the interconnectors with France. That kind of situation is not sustainable for Germany long term. <coughs> the, the only solution is to build massive storage, and, and that applies to Germany as, as well as any other countries. We just The UK happens to be probably about 10 years behind Germany in terms of that kind of situation, but it will happen to us as well. Coming in. Uh, yes, next indeed, you, sir. Um, if you just wait for the microphone. Oh, sorry. Oh, right. Hi, Steve Edwards, British Solar Renewables. Uh, we, we inject volatility into the grid. <laughs> um, at least the physical market. The physical market. I was interested in the professor's slide that seemed to place much greater value on distributed storage versus bulk storage. Is, is that driven by uh, an assumption that volatility is increased locally um, and, and emerges locally, or is that applying the national picture to the distributed solution, if you like? Well, the, 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 uh, the benefit, the difference between bulk and distributed is that uh, uh, distributed storage can, can help with making better use of the cables and, and transformers which are on the street. And if you, if you look at what the overall cost of your bill is, it's about 30% of the bill which you pay is distribution networks. So if the storage can, can help with postponing or removing the, the um, uh, reinforcements of these networks, that's where, where you come from. Bulk storage can help with this because it, 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 so, so that's where the difference is. If, if I'm allowed a quick follow up question, then um, you, you also identified much higher ramp rates and much higher discharge rates for distributed storage. Are there technologies that hit both uh, the ability to be distributed and the ability to survive those uh, discharge and usage cycles? Uh, I'm not a technology expert. Uh, the, the, um, uh, that's certainly a challenge for battery type storage uh, because degradation effects are in fact quite significant. I've shown that what I showed was only two weeks of a quite heavy going. It's not it's not the entire year like this. Yeah. But certainly, you know, that that's a that's a big issue certainly in the academic community. People who do storage uh, uh, are you know very very aware of that. Um, and I can also tell you for example an example of the uh, battery technology which is being now um, um, installed um, as part of low carbon electric funding activity and when we showed these diagrams to the people who build that they say no no we cannot possibly do that so I think that there is an issue in there to to uh, that, that there is I think there is a there is a uh, area for improvement on, on on small scale technologies which can actually do this discharge and charge at a quite it aggressive looks a bit like rate. A sweet spot. It's come to the fore a little bit, I think, in other markets a little bit quicker than here. So Puerto Rico is an obvious example where there's now a ramp rate mandate, um, especially for solar. And I think what we'll see there is a lot of um, batteries going in again to deal with that. And while I agree that there is a degradation issue with batteries, I don't think it's a problem that there's a degradation issue per se. I think the issue is that when you buy something from a manufacturer and you tell them you're going to use it in this particular way, that he can guarantee that that um, is only going to degrade the battery to a certain extent, and then you know how to put it into your financial model. But so the you point is move to a least model rather than a whole model? No, no, even when you buy the battery, um, it's going to degrade, but the issue is that you understand how much it's going to degrade and you can model it. Um, you know, if you buy a battery and you don't understand how it's going to degrade, how do you make your investment decision? So the key is to be able to work with a manufacturer to say, this is how we're going to use it. Um, he'll say, well, this is how it's going to degrade. We guarantee after 10 years it's going to be at a certain level. And then you can financially model it. <coughs> De degradation isn't the issue. Understanding the level of degradation is the issue. Yeah, just uh, very briefly, I mean, because, because distributed storage potentially provides value to the to the network, local networks, you know, K 
cables and transformers, they go 60 years, no problem. We don't need to touch them. So to compete against that that kit is not uh, is 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 not not trivial. Thank you. Um, if the mic could be passed the row behind you, still with you, lady there, please, and then you'll go back. Yes. Janet Wood from New Power, which is a monthly publication about the UK power industry. Um, I think Ofgem is pushing uh, for um, merchant plants in the in the storage space. Uh, but given how difficult it is to access these important revenue streams from defying uh, new network investment and uh, generation investment, is that the best model to go for? What What is required in the business model to make it work? Well, I can tell you the, the example of this. There is a project, you're, you're probably familiar with Ofgem, running low carbon network funding. Now it's called Network Innovation Competition, which was 500 million pound for, for innovation and demonstration of technologies. And it's a project run by UK Power Networks called Smarter Network Storage. Um, and uh, I just, in fact, was to, today, in the, in the, his, his plant is now running. Um, and that's, a, that, that's funded, it's, it's not a merchant development, it's funded by low carbon funding activity. Yeah? And one of the core aspects of that is to demonstrate the ability to provide the services across different sectors and see what we need to do to make that a reality. So we still do not have full-blown market in place which would allow that to happen, but we are working on that quite hard and hopefully it will not be... But know, I, it will, I don't it will, think that, that the networks is, would be able to, to carry out arbitrage and, and use, offer these other ancillary services because they're, they're regulated and it would be that's a diff, that's not a part of their, their business model. You know, that's 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 a kind of you know, that's a different. There is discussion now going on as to whether we should change that, whether network operators could own storage or not. But but, but it, it's as I say, this is only this is only a trial. This is a demonstration. It's not uh, you know we have paid consumers have paid for that storage. Yeah? Storage this storage does not need to survive and make money on a commercial basis. It's a demonstration activity. But Ovgem is funding this to, to get full clarity about what's broken and needs fixing in the marketplace to make sure that to, to make sure the market is, is developed so that merchant storage can take place. That's the idea. Anyway, so yeah. I'm not familiar with the uh, exact discussion you're referencing, so I don't quite know what um, your your what application you're talking about, but my general point would be everybody knows nobody builds any assets on a merchant basis in the UK. People don't build gas plants, coal plants, nuclear plants, wind farms, solar farms. So it's difficult to see why storage would be different. That's probably right. Um, two along to your right, if you'd be so kind. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kate O'Donnell and Ernst and Young. Uh, obviously, the US is a uh, way ahead of the UK in terms of regulation and making the numbers stack up on storage. What do you see being the key changes in the regulation that you'd like to see in the UK? To John. Um, I, I think the, um, the first thing that's unlocked the business model in the US is the recognition of the value of fast acting storage. So FERC recognized that by mandating the system operators would procure fast acting storage, they could procure lower volumes of storage, so pay more per unit, but procure lower volumes and ultimately deliver lower costs to the consumer. Uh, I know that can often have been quite distracted with EMR over the past while, but nobody's really considering how to unlock similar benefits um, for storage here in the UK. There's plenty of work going on on technology demonstration, but uh, from our point of view as a developer, looking at those market and regulatory barriers uh, is much more important. Thank you. Um, right, the person at the back of the room hasn't done too well out of this. Um, in the next row back, yes, the gentleman with his hand up there to the middle there. And then we'll come forward again. Hello, question for Goran. I'm Carlos Huggins from UCL Consultants, which um, 
is a consultancy, makes uh, UCL researchers available to the outside world to answer different questions. Anyway, but two points of clarification, please, Karan. The first one, I think one of your arguments you made was that if you're going to make money out of a storage unit, so a classical Welsh mountain, in the future, these units will have to be bigger and bigger for you to make money. Am I right on that? Did I interpret you correctly? Yeah. No. Okay, then, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no. But the, the, the follow-up then, then, towards the end of your talk, I think you said that the key competitor for, again, no, again storage, was the demand side stuff. I just wondered if the panel could give an opinion on where is that in terms of actually solving the problem compared to storage? Um, where is it? Um, it's it's probably not that far behind, to be honest. I mean, you know, the smart meter is actually monitoring the grid, um, but I think you know, technology. I think is is there if you wanted it, prepared to install it. I think the um, the uh, the ergonomics and the, the personal input into that is a long way from it. I think you know, people are accepting that you know, they're going to have to shed, it, shed load on their factories in the middle of the day, is that, you know, which is what we're really talking about, talking about you know, to make a big difference. Um, you know, it could completely change the working way we work in this country if you want to go down that route. And I think you know, changing, people don't like change, and you know, changing the whole country is just going to take an awful lot of doing. It'll take years to implement. Yeah, I'm kind of tempted to tell you a story of, of um, uh, my smart dishwasher. Uh, so what it does, when you finish with your dinner and wine at 9.30, you put the stuff in, you've got two options to press. One is standard option, which starts immediately, does the normal job. And the smart option uh, sends signal to somebody who knows what to do with it through a smart meter, which I'm going to have according to the UK government in 2019. So, so what it does, these three pieces of information are the following. The first one is that there is a dishwasher available to start at 9.37 p.m. in 6 Old Farm House Drive in Oxshot, where I live. Second piece of information is, is what's the length of the cycle? Is it Half an hour is it at two hours, yeah? How much champagne you had that evening? <laughs> and the third one is, the most important one is, when do you want this to be done by? In my case, 6.30 a.m. when I wake up, I want to have a cup of tea from a freshly cleaned mug. But I am very flexible in terms of when this would start. In my case, you know, it's uh, 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 fortunate enough that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, quiet and it, I'm, I'm sleeping far away from it. So, I, I, you know, it doesn't matter when it starts. We did the analysis as to what the value of that pressing smart option is if, 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 the, if, if we are start pressing some, some options today, how much money we would save to the UK and how much we, we, should, we should get. And it's, depending on, let's say, you know, it's between three and five pounds, not huge amounts. But in 2025, it's more than 100 pounds. Okay. And what that means, and that's, that's not to do with peaks, as you said, this is to do with the fact that overnight we've got nuclear running, and if we've got wind, managing demand and supply balance is going to be, overnight is going to be very, very difficult. So if we've got somebody who can, or to pricing or whatever, somebody who can schedule those, we'll be saving a massive amount of money. And just to say that this dishwasher, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's not at all more expensive than the ordinary one because this is just really few lines of code in the microprocessor, which is already quite sophisticated. It's about, it's less than three euros is the cost of the smart stuff in there, yeah? So, and then what the analysis done was that when we said, let's now suppose that it is 2025, that we start pressing smart options across all our stuff, but you can, you, but just make sure in here that there is no compromise on service quality, okay? All my champagne glasses will be cleaned, yes? I'm not, I'm, you know, so, and all your shirts and socks, if we are doing the, the washing machines, will be all sorted out, yeah? So, and what we've then did analysis is to show that in the future, 
the value of flexibility would be incredibly important. In fact, the more important the amount of energy you consume. So we said, let's suppose that 50% in the UK of people press smart option across all their appliances, and 50% of them can't be bothered. Okay? For the same amount of energy consumed, people who can't be bothered, their bills will be three times higher. Okay? So I'm, you know, that's what I'm saying. You know, if, we, if, the, if we go with smart metering, we do this properly, potentially that could, given that this is very different from what we are now, because it, that, would, that for me means that the way in which you consume will be more important than the amount you consume. We are not in that world at the moment. So, and given that, there is, you know, as I said, there is no cost, you know, cost is trivial in this. And when we, when we talk to, when we talk to uh, kind of innovative suppliers who are trying to challenge the present industry, they say, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to buy this smart dishwasher to people who can't afford it, to, you know, to feel poor. Because if they press option, smart option, most of the time, we're going to make, we're going to make 100 pounds. The, the, the thing costs 350. So if they stay with us for six years, everybody's happy. So I think demand side, I would not, you know, I, I completely agree. There are issues, are we going to be bothered or not be bothered? I want to suggest, fine, we're going to pay 15 billion pound more if we can't be bothered. So I think that, that, that given, given how, how big that is, I wouldn't rule out demand side from, from the development. Just Sorry for taking a bit. No, no. Just as sad, we are about to develop a domestic system that works on analog. So you don't have to buy the smart you know, machines. They manage the system for you on an overall basis. So that's why I say the technology is there. Yeah. We've got five minutes left. Um, so I'm tempted to sort of take a couple of really burning questions and then probably look to wrap up. So if the hands, the hands are still up even with that introduction. So why don't I go to the man at the back and then I come forward. So starting, yes, in the middle there, the microphone's coming across. As long as this is not a question about flywheels. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, my name is George Plasinos from SDNC, and we develop flywheels. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask: uh, Does the community general care how green is the technology for energy storage? Uh, or the community only cares about cost per kilowatt and response time? Is there any? Does anybody really care how green is technology if you use any chemicals if it has any harmful in it? Just curious. Okay, thank you. So the question is about how uh, green natural technology is. Could you pass it forward two rows, please? The microphone I'm throwing to you. Um, um, it's just over your right shoulder. Thank you. I think. I think. Um, so, sorry, can, can I just get this, the question? Oh, okay, get the question. Sorry, sorry. Okay. I should get there. Thanks. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm Ben Guest, uh, CEO of Hazel Capital. Um, Speaking as an investor, I'm trying to figure out, and this is probably a question for John, but maybe it's also others, um, how big is the opportunity here? It, and I was curious why was it PGM um, invested in this? Uh, why didn't they do it themselves? Possibly because it's small scale and kind of experimental, but wouldn't they eventually just do it themselves? Um, if the national grids or large operators <coughs> or large bases of you know, customer owners just wanted to do this themselves? Two extremely simple questions. I want some very simple answers. Can I, can I just answer that quickly? Yes. Uh, yeah. Google investing in energy storage companies in America or something like that, and your answer will be that it, it's like it's generally accepted in America right now that energy storage companies are going to be a huge growth in terms of capital gains and everything like that. Have a look. Well, the, the equipment might still be made by independent manufacturers. I'm talking about infrastructure investors. Would they get locked out by you know, the grid operators? Just... You look you're looking at a completely different system that's going to happen over the next 10 or 20 years. The whole thing's going to be changed upside down. Grids are going to be completely different to what you're going to be looking at now. So you are looking at, just quickly, If you, I don't know if anyone's heard of the Pathfinder project that's going on in America, whereby they've got, this is an example of, of the way it'll go. They've, they've got problems with electricity in Los Angeles and Southern California right now. They've got, I think they've got two nuclear power stations just gone out, and they've even got problems beyond that. 
The um, announced in September was an eight billion dollar project between some big companies, including Dresser and Magnum Energy. You can Google this on the internet as well. Um, whereby and due transmission, and the whole thing was basically to get the electricity to Los Angeles, right? They've got an excess of wind power in Wyoming, which is over a thousand miles away. So the, the big idea is to get all that electricity all a thousand miles over to Los Angeles and what they're going to do is build a, a 525 miles transmission cable to Utah they're going to store that electricity there the technology happens to be in huge soul caverns uh, which, which is I guess good for us but at the end of the day and then they're going to use that electricity uh, from the the Hoover Dam line over to Los Angeles now that's going to get nine point i think it's 9.1 terawatt hours extra electricity going to los angeles that's the kind of scale of the thing that has to happen in the future and all this kind of messed up electricity market at the moment and it is messed up all over the place it's messed up for gas as well that will be around for a few years but it'll certainly sort itself out in the next 10, 10 or 20 years and and if you look at but i guess if you're looking at investing in anything and i know i'd say this but i wouldn't i, I think invest in in storage companies is going to be a huge growth for investors. John? Uh, I, I think there are two parts to Ben's question. One is the size of the opportunity and one is who is the potential owner. Um, and the size of the opportunity, I, I agree, yeah, I agree, with I, I agree, I agree it's, it's, it's very big. Yeah. Um, and if you take California is a good uh, example, you know, it's a 60 gigawatt market, 1.3 gigawatt mandate for 2020. So you can see similar sort of things rolling out here. On, on who owns, I think, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, the SNS project that Gore mentioned is uh, quite a, an interesting examination of that here in the UK. So potential for, say, a distribution operator to own or potential for an independent to own. If a storage device is partially used for distribution deferral but for the rest of the time used for arbitrage or ancillary services, who is the best person positioned to take benefit from the other revenue streams? Um, possibly one way to look at it is that third parties would contract with network companies to provide um, capacity for defined periods during the year and outside of that be free to use the device to best effect. Network companies aren't really best place I would say to access those market benefits whereas um, developers uh, probably are and that probably opens up ownership opportunities for, for funds and things like that but Thank you. evolving space that's it. Thanks. James you're a green investor, do you think about how green technology is that you're investing in? We might do. Um, I'm not sure investors are quite as excited about it. I mean, I think it's um, it's uh, you know, the, the hygiene factor is what is the risk reward profile. It, it, if it, if you can achieve that with other credentials, then that will enhance the um, the chance of that being a successful fundraising. But um, I mean, just as a more general observation, I'm sort of struck by by some of the discussion that we just had and a parallel. That, um, that we have been experiencing in a slightly different sector, which is the energy efficiency sector, which in some ways is, is quite related to what we've been talking about, particularly the overlap with things like demand response, which um, you know, I think energy efficiency is sort of morphing into resource efficiency uh, and, and, and all coming together. And you know, we've been involved in that space now for, for sort of nearly four years. And you, know, you look at the macro opportunity, as we've been talking about with storage, it's colossal. There is an enormous need for greater energy efficiency, which will only go to solving some of the, the generation issues that we've been talking about. You then look at the rate of progress, and it's disappointing, I think, to, you know, at best. And you say, well, why is that? And our experience is that it's a scale issue again. You know, either you go for massive macro projects, which in the energy efficiency world just happens to be difficult to identify. In the storage world, I think we talked about some projects that would hit that. You know, the alternative is you go right to the other end of the spectrum and you become quite entrepreneurial about how you get some of these activities off the ground. And you know, every single project comes with a series of decision makers and characteristics that are specific to that particular project. And you know, our experience in that world, and I can sort of sense some parallels in this one, is that you've sort of got to start somewhere. And you know, by doing more at the sort of the, the, the grassroots level with either people who are sort of early adopters who, who or who happen to find themselves in a situation where 
economically it just makes more sense and therefore they get up and, and do it earlier. That then spreads some of the, these concepts more broadly and allows them to be more generally taken up. Um, and so, you know, I, I sense that it's probably going to be, you know, coming from both ends. There will be some macro projects just because um, uh, there are certain jurisdictions where there are such significant problems that need to be solved that governments and other organisations will support that. The other end, there are some really quite interesting opportunities as investors in some quite m micro areas and we were talking about some opportunities the other day in, um, in in the sort of the residential roof market you know that has blossomed over the last few years those systems are in place they happen to have particular uh, subsidy regimes associated with them which means that if you put storage uh, with those systems you retain the economics of the original subsidy but you can then benefit from some additional um, return. That's quite attractive. It's quite a micro opportunity, but it's one that could spread this concept more broadly and allow it to develop. Thank you. Um, Steve Gorans, with each person finishing off with a thought. Um, I think, as, as I said earlier, I think for me, the, you know, this is um, you know, it's a huge issue, a huge problem. I and mean, there is no one silver bullet. I think mean, you know, so how can we that solve it? Um, I don't think it is. I think you know all the technologies we've talked about today. They all have the right place if it, things stack up for them properly. But you have to analyse each individual application to make sure that you've got the right technology and that you're applying it in the right way to make sure you get that right return on investment. Thank you. Last word. You. No, not word. Not word. Happy, happy with that. Happy yeah. that. Yep. Okay. Well, in which case, what should you Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd just like to now uh, close and express our thanks to the experts gathered here tonight. Um, we have covered a lot of ground, and um, I think it was Jeff said earlier that we have a lazy system in the UK, and I think, in fact, of course, we have a lazy system in the world uh, where energy and energy efficiency and storage is concerned. Uh, but we do not have a bunch of lazy people here. May I say also, James, I mean, it's on the, some of those remarks you just made in closing resonated with me about the macro and micro opportunities around this, which I think are absolutely key uh, as, I, as I speak for the Commonwealth platform and looking at the developing world and, and the way in which we need to address uh, some of the off-grid solutions. So in practice, I, I think this has been a fantastic evening. I thank particularly James and your team here at Ingenious for hosting us this evening. Uh, for all of the speakers, for, to Clive as our collaborator in this, thank you so much for giving of your time and your, your energy and your insights tonight. And um, I understand we should have some refreshments. Look forward to networking among you afterwards. But thank you very much, Jeff. <laughs>